Before I do any forging on this old anvil, I want to dress the edges, make sure any of the existing chips are cleaned up and aren't sharp, and generally just get it in better shape than what it is at the moment. And in a small shop like this, the ideal tool is probably an angle grinder, and since there's no electricity in the shop, for me the ideal tool is a cordless angle grinder. And with the help from our folks over at Metabo, we've got a new angle grinder that is going to be dedicated to this shop. They also sent a nice cordless drill. So this is a nice basic set of tools to start work in this shop. These aren't cheap tools, these are premium tools, and I'll talk more about those before the end of the video. Of course, my number one concern is dealing with things like this big chip here. That is just sharp and snaggy, and that's either going to lead to a bigger chip on the edge of the anvil, which causes more damage and is harder to repair later, or at the very least, if you forge in this area, that is going to affect the quality of your work and can introduce stress points that could cause cracks in your work later. So no matter what it takes, I want to get that chip out of there, even if I've got to put a big divot in there. I'd rather have the soft divot than the big chip. In addition, I want to radius the edges so that I've got a variety of profiles that I can work on if I'm working at the edge of the anvil. So through here, I'll put a pretty big radius a little bit less through here, a little bit less as I go through here. At no place do I want an absolute sharp edge. I'm going to start with a 36 grit flap disc for this. You could use a hard wheel if you want to. Yeah, just watching somebody grind an anvil is probably going to be a little boring, so I'm not going to show all of this. Just enough so you get an idea of how I'm approaching it and how aggressive I'm getting with the grinding. I don't want to be real aggressive because I can always come back and take more off later, but it's really hard to put back if you get carried away. I feel like a flap disc is really the ideal thing for this. I'm not trying to take so much material off, and the flap disc really contours quite nicely, creating these rounded edges. You can see some of the weld bead from where this anvil's been repaired. Unless it's really a problem, I'm not taking that down. I would rather just work around any little seams or imperfections in the weld then try and grind all that off and then probably end up having to fix it again. At some point we might go ahead and do some more welding on this anvil if it needs it, but I'd rather work with it for six months or a year before I make that decision. It's really amazing how you can learn to work around the imperfections and oddities in an anvil and even use them to your advantage at times. The tip of the horn on a lot of old anvils have been bashed in, and that's just because people got tired of smacking their thigh on the sharp point on the horn. So it's really common to see anvils with the tip just upset down with a hammer. I'll clean it up. I don't want to make a point out of it, but I'll at least knock the upset off and make it a little bit cleaner. I'll go over the entire thing again with each progressively finer grit until I get it to the point that I'm happy with it.
Well, that didn't go too bad. That was only about a half an hour's worth of work to get it down to this point. They did a 36 grit flap disc, then a 60 grit flat disc, and then 120. I'd take it to 220, but I don't have any 220 grit, so maybe I'll do that at another time. And this is something you might do in increments. You don't want to take too much off because you can always grind more down. But if you take more off than you want, the only way to put it back is with a welder, and that's a real pain. That's something for a whole different video. There are some other tools and alternatives, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But I do want to take a moment and thank Metabo for sending these wonderful tools out. They are not paying to sponsor this video per se, but they did provide the tools. And while in most cases, free tools aren't the same as a paid sponsorship, since I was looking to buy Metabo tools to equip this shop with, this is about the same as a paid sponsorship. So if you want to, we can call this a sponsored video. And thank you, Metabo, for sponsoring the video. The grinder is the WPB18LTBL11-125. So that's a four and a half to five inch grinder, has the equivalent power of an 11 amp plug-in grinder. Features a soft start so it doesn't just jerk you as soon as it powers up. And it comes to a stop really quick. It's got a braking system in there, so you're less likely to set a running grinder down on your workbench and have it take off down the workbench somewhere. Features toolless changes on the discs. That's something I really like. I'm at a point that I don't think I would ever buy another angle grinder that does not have some sort of a toolless change. Having to always mess with wrenches that are buried somewhere in a drawer of oddball stuff gets to be a real pain, so I like the toolless changeover that this grinder offers. One unusual feature it has, and I've never seen this on anything else, is the battery can rotate. So if for some reason this feels off balance and you want the weight of the battery down on one side or the other, it's just a little release switch, and you can rotate this it's in 90 degree increments. Not sure if I'll use that a lot. It's something I've never even thought of before, but it's an interesting feature. And it could be one of those things that I really like once I figure out where it's needed. This also has a safety clutch, so if you're cutting with a cutting disc and you twist a little bit or the material moves and it binds the disc, this will shut off so you don't shatter a disc or cause some other problem. So it's really going to be a nice grinder to have over in this shop. Like I say, the Metabo tools, I think I will dedicate primarily to this shop. Doesn't mean you won't see them other places, but I think if they live over here, I won't have to run back and forth anywhere near as much as I have been. They also provided a nice 18 volt cordless drill. This is the BS18LTX-3 BLQI Metal. They got some really long part numbers for these. I'll leave some links down below if you want to find more stats and data on these. This one came as a kit with a charger and two batteries. The angle grinder was just the bare tool, so one of the batteries that came with this is what I've been using in the angle grinder. This drill has three speeds on it, so it's got more speed options than most cordless drills do. And it's got the usual clutch down here. If you're driving screws or something, you want to make sure they all go in at the same pressure, you can set the clutch. Or you can set it to a drill setting that is full power all the time. Now, if you spin this clutch dial on the base all the way to one direction, it goes into what they call impulse mode. So you can kind of feather things in. It gives a little pulses. It's not really an impact. But depending on how hard you pull the trigger, that's really interesting. I'm going to have to try that out. That might really help if you've got a drill bit stuck or something like that. Put it in that and you can break that chip off and get the drill bit free. They also sent us one more little bonus item. This is something that's a new release. I'm having trouble finding anybody actually selling this yet, but I'm sure in the next month or so, most of the dealers will have this in stock. And that's this light. This is a tripod light stand. Comes with a stand, got a place for the battery mounted into the stand. It's height adjustable. The lights can be, let me turn that off, that's kind of bright. The lights can be folded up and the whole thing goes down into a little carrying packet. Well, this is an excellent work light if you're working someplace that doesn't have power, like if you're just building this building and you need to have more light in it. I'm also finding it to be a pretty good video light. Not exactly a color match for these other lights, but it adds enough more light to take out some of the harsh shadow in this little building. And I think it's going to be a really good addition for making videos in here. So once again, I want to thank Metabo for helping equip this small off-grid shop 
I'd like to say non-electric, but battery tools are technically electric, just doesn't have power coming from the grid or an extension cord running from someplace with a plug. The batteries need to be charged elsewhere and then brought into here. And that's a great solution if you're working in an old barn or a shed, something like that, and don't want the extra expense to run power. The battery operated tools cost less than what I spent to run power to the other shop. Now one of you asked about milling an anvil. There's nothing wrong with milling an anvil if you have access to a milling machine and cutters that will cut the hardened steel plate. Remember, the plate on the top of an old anvil is hard steel, the body is wrought iron. So this isn't going to cut real easily, but if you've got the right tools and you know how to do that, you could do it. The risk of doing that, on the other hand, is that you're making that plate thinner. It starts off as half, maybe even three quarter inches thick, and the thinner it gets, the more fragile it's going to get, the easier it's going to be to crack it or delaminate it from the body of the anvil. So unless you just really have to clean that up, I would avoid taking too much material off. If it's just a little light pass to take some scratches out, that's one thing. But if you've got eighth or quarter inch low spots and depressions, it's probably better to work around those or get really serious, preheat, use hard facing rod, build that up, and then mill down the hard facing rod so that you're not making that extra thin. Without a milling machine, what do you do if you want to grind the surface? That's when one of these big cup stones can come in handy. The arbor of the grinder is set back up inside, so this can go flat on the anvil, and it's then much easier to get a nice flat surface. In the past, I've used a woodworking belt sander to do some of that and try and clean that up. It's not very aggressive, even with a 36 grit belt on a sander. It takes a long time to take this down because it's not very high speed. But something like a cup disc should be a good option. For the most part, I would say don't overdress your anvil. Start doing the things that really need to. Take the chips out, take the sharp edges down a little bit, and then learn to work around the other imperfections. Some of these things, like that one big chip I took off on the far side of the anvil, I think that will actually turn out to be a useful little depression for something, maybe forming a certain type of a shoulder or a little bend, or maybe even working a shallow spoon or something like that in there. I don't think it's going to be a problem. It's not going to be a flaw in the anvil. It's just a little bit of character, and the little dips and depressions in the anvil, you learn to use to your advantage or how to work around them. Polishing the face of the anvil and making it dead smooth is kind of nice, but it's not going to stay that way, and unless you're forging high-end knives that are going to need that perfect finish, I'm not sure it's worth it for general blacksmithing. So try not to get too carried away dressing your anvil. I do hope this helps answer some of your questions. Hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop. Make something, but stay safe. Wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next video.